what's up everybody hope you're having an awesome day Davis here with wit digital along with Steven Christopher and we're back with another episode of home service success TV our guest today runs a media buying company out of Austin Texas he grows big brands in the home service industry um, he's actually classically trained in advertising um, from BBDO and the Richards group both large legacy agencies that have worked with major brands in the automobile industry um, and other industries such as the hospitality industry. Um, he's worked with brands such as Jeep and Motel 6. Um, so he's got a big brand perspective that he's brought to the home service industry, which is really unique. And in fact, early in his career, he did sports marketing with the Dallas Mavericks, working on their sponsorship marketing program. He then moved to the agency life doing brand affinity marketing. And he got into the home service industry by helping out his friends who owned HVAC, plumbing, and electrical businesses with media buying to build their brands. So he actually started doing media buying as a favor for his friends in the home service industry. And then he realized the benefits of starting and owning his own business and also the benefits of serving his community. And so that's when he decided to, to turn um, what was a favor into a full-time gig, and he started Pence Media. Um, Jeff is one of these marketing types who's fascinated by how people make decisions. He spent his career trying to influence consumer purchase behavior and measuring the real-world business impact of marketing campaigns. For his clients, he brings a left-brain, right-brain hybrid perspective to strategy with ability to bring plans to life through unique creative and understanding of the ever-changing digital landscape and industry-specific analytics. So we've got some awesome topics to talk about today. And without further ado, welcome Jeff Pence from Pence Media. What's up, Jeff? Hey, good intro, thanks. Appreciate that. Dude, you've definitely done a lot of things. And like, as Davis was going down that list, all I'm thinking is, okay, so we have somebody that worked with some of the biggest brands and under the biggest advertising agencies in the entire country and now you're bringing that enterprise level service and knowledge and all of that into home service. Like, is there anybody better than you at doing this within the entire home service industry? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I like to think that we, we have a pretty good, pretty good perspective on things. Um, and it is funny, like the, I think the unique part of like where, um, you know, uh, uh, Pitts Media is a you know, family business, my wife and I, and, we both worked on, you know, the other side of the equation from, you know, where you're, she was on the sales side and in management in the media and I was on the agency side. And we, we both saw that at a certain point you work on big brands and it is a little bit sexy, right? Um, it's cool to, to have it on your resume, no matter how good your PowerPoint was, no matter how good your plan was, it was a little bit like moving the Titanic um, where you're only incrementally even though you're helping and obviously smart people help, help big brands grow. Um, it was a little bit of lack that fulfillment of helping somebody win today, help them win tomorrow, be close enough to the decisions that take somebody from, you know, um, a business that is stable and that's really growing um, and see them take off. That's, that's probably been the, the most fun part of taking all that stuff we did before and putting it to work you know, in home services um, because we can impact people's businesses and their lives. And, you know, we get to know their, their whole team, their families. Um, it's a different level of, you know, um, fulfillment from a professional standpoint because you get to actually awesome, see man. the growth. So we've been lucky. We have clients that they execute, right? We don't, we don't turn wrenches. Um, I have my father-in-law to fix my plumbing stuff. Like I don't, we, I can't do that, but I can help on the marketing side. Um, uh, and for a lot of the folks in home services, that's a missing piece, right? Um, I'm sure you guys talk to a lot of different folks in the industry where what gets somebody from one truck to five trucks to 10 trucks, maybe you're $5 million, like those resources and that thinking exist. There's all the trade resource groups from the next stars, the SGIs, practices. Like, there's a ton of smart thinking that this is the, this is the, the path, right? Um, and the execution side is super important. The phone rings, I execute, I can do all the things, I can train, I can grow my team. Like they're all internally focused. 
what's interesting is what takes somebody from that three to five million bucks to 20, 40, 80 million dollars is a whole different set of skills. You know, and it's all in perspective on what you are as a company. If to get to that point, to get to that five million point, really do it this just do what everybody else does, right? Follow the follow the path. Make sure your operations are buttoned up. There's a way to do that. Make sure you're doing things, you know, in this this template because the mistakes have already been made. So you don't have to go relearn everything. What's different and unique though in marketing to be the next level where the entry is going a little bit is you have to be different in some way. Um, because when you're that big and the industry has changed a little bit, so even in the last, gosh, what you guys probably see it five, 10 years where everything's changed, not everything, but like it's gone from siloed services, electricians, plumbers, HVAC. Now it's a full service offering is the way it is the norm. Mm -hmm. And so if you offer the same things as everybody else, and you built your business in this this very structured way, which is smart. The next step, you have to have a different perspective on it. It's a hard thing to get your head around sometimes. Mm. So, Davis, sorry, I know you probably have a question, but I have a question that I have to ask right here because it came up, and so I think that it's important. Um, so, Jeff, you mentioned a couple times, like you mentioned the structure, right? Like, kind of like structure, follow the follow the path, execution, and in our world in the digital marketing world, and I would assume this bleeds over into yours uh, in, in a full marketing scope for home service companies, like people are always looking for this magic silver bullet, right? They're like, oh my gosh, I saw in this one group where this one guy ran this one ad and got like a thousand percent ROI on it. And I'm going to change my whole business model and go this way. They're always looking for this like magical bullet. And I would love your, your, perspective on people that are doing that, right? People that are always looking for this magic thing that's going to grow things by thousands of percent overnight. We, it doesn't exist in our world, even though people think that they have it. And marketers out there will sell them something that they know they're going to buy into just because it says grow your business by a thousand percent. Here's how to get 7,000 new leads next month. I mean, it, it, are we missing anything or is anything in your line of this business different to where when, when you say like to stand out and do something different, that doesn't necessarily mean create a whole new structure and a whole new pattern or a whole new thing that's like going to work this magic. Like it just doesn't exist, right? People need to do things that work consistently, always be open to innovation. And then talk a little bit about when you say stand out and do something different. What does that mean in your world on the on the big media side that's a good point it, it really is a it's a philosophical mindset shift right where um we had a couple of good points in there so one on like the the point about like the magic pill like that's a good point it doesn't exist um if you don't think about marketing as fitness you're thinking about it all wrong mm. you don't you don't get ripped overnight right you don't get you don't get abs by you know, six minute abs doesn't work, right? You've got to do a bunch of things, right? And do them consistently over time. And those deliver results. Now, it, even in that world, what you do matters, right? And how you do it, who's helping you get there. The, the analogy is pretty, pretty spot on in terms of, you know, how fit is your marketing? And is it appropriate for what you want? Guys who are, you know, training for the Olympics have a very different sort of routine, because their goals are different versus us who are, you know, whether you're a dad trying to just be able to pick up your kids or you're, maybe you have a personal goal, like from a, maybe you're a runner, like those are different things and you need a different plan. Um, and the mindset shift is I can't just take a pill. It's, mm. it's a commitment. It's a way to do it. Differently. So that's, that's why I say do something differently. Cause it is, it's a mindset shift from what really what it takes to, you know, to follow the path. Um, what we see, this is kind of the practical side of that, that answer is, so where, where we typically step in, it can help add a lot of value is when you've reached a point, you've got a really strong operation, you've got really strong foundational digital tactics that are absolutely critical, right? The internet is the front page of your business, essentially. It's the front door. If you, if you can't be found, if you're not optimized, like what we can add isn't necessarily as helpful. That's, that's the foundation which you guys, you know, you guys get that. Um, but the next step is 
a little more of a strategic bet. If you've reached a point where you're scaling your company and you need to reach a point, I need a different bucket of lead generation. That's really what it is. I need to diversify that mix. Because you can take digital marketing and it's scalable, but if you need to change the ratios in your business, right? Um, as you grow, you have more back of house. You need to have a, a bucket of cheaper leads. I still have to fill this bucket. It needs to be buttoned up. But I need to have a different play I run. That's a strategic decision and it's a bet. And so you have to have the right information to make that decision. Um, if you go to, you know, your buddy like, well, I, I, I believe in outdoor boards. Okay, well, that's, that's a very viable tactic and that works. I believe in radio. That's a great place to be, but you've got to understand the nuance of how it works, why it works, how to make it successful long-term, how to make the numbers work. Um, how does that apply to your market, right? Because every market you're, so there's, little, there's all the, all of the, the, the marketing work that goes in, comes into play because it's a, it's a strategic bet. Where am I placing those chips? And if you're smarter about where you're placing the chips, your chances of being successful there go up dramatically. So um, that's, that's the mindset shift that we hope that, you know, and the, and the clients often, we're, we're very lucky in that a lot of times by the time folks get to us, they've had that discussion already. And so we can just help, you know, make the decision, help make the better decisions a lot of times. Um, but it is kind of a different, different discussion um, about what, what gets you there. And um, all that comes along with that too. So there's all the operational changes that, you have to mm -hmm. account for and at least plan for that, you know, it's helping them understand what it does to their call center the types of calls you get from this new lead bucket. It may take some different training. Um, do you have the right financing offering? Like little things that you just say, Oh, well, I want to do this and I want to grow. All those things kind of fall out of that. And that's, that's the goes back on then. Then there's, there's operational training that can help you accomplish that because those things exist. And that template exists for this next phase. It's the decision of, what's right for my business given these unique set of circumstances that are all variable at the high level. Man, yeah. So it is super multifaceted from, you know, beyond the scope of just internet marketing, which is really what gets those small guys to be, you know, in the multiple million dollar revenue range to now you're looking at outdoor advertising. You're looking at, okay, I've got various audience segments that are going to interact with, you know, my advertisements differently, whether it's broadcast, billboard, or internet, what have you. Um, so you kind of all have to take all of that into, into play um, and measure it over probably a longer period of time too. So you're, you're also changing expectations around how, how much time is this payoff going to be, you know, with internet marketing, it can be kind of a quick turnaround within months, yeah. but with large brand building, you, you might be looking at years. Yeah. And, it, you know, we have to think that you know, all marketing works. And that's a point from a marketer. I don't know, mm -hmm. take it with a grain of salt. Um, but it's all about expectations. It's right. what what do I think is going to happen? Is that aligned with what this tactical bucket can actually deliver for me? If those things are aligned, that's a good recipe. Yeah. Because um, then it sets the timeline expectations to where, you know, it, didn't, it shouldn't take years um, if you've got a, a focused plan. But all those buckets, whether it's mass media, television, digital video, radio, outdoor, they all have different windows. Mm -hmm. And as long as you know what KPIs to look for, you know, you can, you can start to see those changes. Um, it's like, it's why you, back to our fitness analogy, that's why you take the before picture. If you don't take the before picture, mm -hmm. you don't know the progress you're making because it's incremental, right? right? It's, you just, one day you notice, oh, my pants fit differently. Well, it's because you're making progress, right? Those are things that yeah. um, you hope to see. And yeah, obviously, you might, might faster not better. The mirror every day, but after six months, you're like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. And then you know, that's that's it. And that's where you know, it's it's fun to um, anecdotally some of the clients, like you know, a year in the program or even a couple of years. I've had a client call just the Friday night with the client, and um, we got talking. And he's like, "Man, we're three years in working together," and there's a whole paradigm shift in how he thinks about where he is. Um, he's in a big market. And he's now playing with the big boys, Like he wasn't on their radar and now he is, which is fun um, yeah. from our standpoint, you know, to help somebody, you know, uh, not just grow, but like it's changed the whole perspective on what's possible now. Totally. Cool. Yeah. I think, 
you know, you talk about, it's interesting that this conversation is kind of going this direction around like a mindset shift because we see it a lot where in, in today's digital world, right, where we click a button and we can buy something from Amazon and it gets delivered tomorrow, we see people wanting to grow as fast as humanly possible, which means how do I get more leads tomorrow? So we want more leads or, you know, our mutual clients always want more leads faster. But what I'm seeing is that where 20 years ago, people had like three and five and 10 and 20 year visions. Now it's like maybe a year, like maybe they have a revenue goal to get, you know, to 5 million by the end of next year. But that's kind of, that's kind of it. And it's just interesting to watch it happen, especially with, you know, all the money, all the private equity money that's in the industry right now, all the companies that are getting bought right now, people are like, are very short sighted. And I think it's something that, you know, that we've been trying to help educate our clients with them. Hey, we can work on the short sighted stuff and in short term lead gen, but we need to think about the long term too. And you need to be investing in these bigger, uh, you know, these bigger lead gen sources in the, in building brand affinity in your market. Cause you might think you're going to double next year, but you don't know what's going to happen with COVID and this, and you might think you're going to sell next year or the year after, but you know, just like every time this private equity money is going to go away and it's going to go dormant for, you know, 10 more years or eight more years before there's this next big buying cycle again. So like people have got to start thinking about their company in a longer term view and it's okay to have a couple year marketing plan, you know, not yeah. just live on pay-per-click, which doesn't do what it did five years ago. <laughs> well, it's interesting. And it, it, you know, Google keeps moving the cheese on, on everybody, right? That happens all the time yep. where it's a little bit of a safety net of if you have a different play that you can, you know, you can use to help get you there. Um, it gives you a little bit of insulation against that. Um, you know, it's funny with that, that, that mindset, that, that disruptive mindset, um, I think is good for home services where that five, 10 year, maybe something that's a vision, but to think five years down the road, gosh, that like, it's good to think about that, but your business is going to change. If you're, if you get the pedal down so much before then, that that plan probably isn't as useful as you think it is. Um, it's helpful for things, you know, like, you know, space planning and, and some down and dirty things, right? How many desks do I need? But, um, there's so much happening in the industry that's good, right? The public equity money raises the stakes a little bit, I feel like, mm -hmm. um, where there's sophistication there. There's still this opportunity for um, knowledge aggregation. Something David and I talked about earlier too, where there's so much unknown about kind of the consumer side of the industry. Like there's everything's happening on the business side, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of change, um, sophistication, right? It's a little bit where insurance was maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, Right, where the offerings were very commoditized, now they have to be differentiated. There's like there, there's roll up happening, um, but there's still this like gap of do we really know what is driving like purchase decision at the consumer mm -hmm. level? It's a big question mark um, because all the data is kind of siloed just based on how the industry is set up. Um, if you're in the package goods world or the auto world, you've got all these silos of information and data, right? Where I know. I can look at across the country, take all this information, roll it up. And if you're PNG, I can know that a five degree swing in temperature in Boston in February is going to equate to, you know, X percent change in, you know, the uh, salt sales, you know, or whatever. Like there's that date, that, that understanding and insight exists for a lot of industries, but not home services. Mm. Think about where the information lives. It's like the owner level, even the super successful ones. Say you've got 25 years of growing a great business. That's a ton of like useful data, right? But four of those are anomalies. You had a drought, you had a recession, you had COVID, you had all this stuff going on. And then look at that 25 years. For the first five years, did you have the same operating knowledge that you did the last 20? Probably not. So now your sample size of real data is of 25, 15. That's not a viable sample size. Um, throw into biases, right? If you win, you tend to give different things credit. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into understanding what drives it. Um, the consumer, the consumer side is changing, right? What people expect, what they want, um, how they buy, the sophistication of products that, um, I don't know, there's a bunch of like interesting little questions that 
home services as an industry hasn't tackled yet, which is super interesting for me as like a marketer for the future. Like, what if we can answer that? Um, I got yeah, what if we can aggregate a rabbit hole all of our experiences as an industry? Yeah, you think about um, there was something. Somebody made a comment at one of the conferences where there was a billion dollars of transactions in the room. It's like that's interesting. Mm-hmm. That data is not collected anywhere. Like you have people like Service Titan that are that maybe could have some of that. Um, you know, I've heard that some of the big equity groups are are adding data scientists to their team. That's really yeah. smart. Like that's a that's a sign that there's sophistication coming to the industry, and that gets me excited. Um, to where we're not relying on anecdotes and um, you know, kind of you know, guesses, best guesses a lot of times, but guesses nonetheless of what what the what does the consumer think and feel and what do they need? Um, we have a pretty good idea, but the empirical data is not there yet. Yeah, it hasn't been like really collected and organized in a way that's actionable. Um, yeah, um, be, it's fun. There's a whole the psychology of you know, of that is interesting because um, it's different by, by trade, right? Uh, the psychology of a big decision, if I'm replacing my AC system, is partially probably driven by a few factors, right? Well, how do we weigh those? How do we weigh my risk aversion? How do we weigh my value of money, um, the, time of my, the time frame of my decision? Like, all these things are super interesting that maybe, maybe some of the big manufacturers are asking these questions, but they're using the information very differently, you know, to predict their demand, to build, you know, their business, not necessarily translate to the service side of things. Right. Well, it just also speaks to how much opportunity there is in this industry to continue to innovate and grow, yeah. um, you know, which is really exciting for me. <laughs> and um, so, how do you, me, I think. So, so how do you deal with that for your clients right now? Like, yeah. How do you, how are you guys dealing with that for your clients right now? Like how are you making decisions on what you put out in commercials or what you put out, you know, in, in, in these other things, right? If we're not really sure exactly why people are buying, you know, we think we know. Um, and I know some of the bigger, some of the bigger companies really think they know. And mm-hmm. I don't think they have a clue, right. Based on what you're saying and how little data we actually have. So what are you guys doing? Like, for the people that are listening to this going, wait a minute. So you're telling me that nobody knows the answer to this. How do we choose what we're, what we're putting out? I think, I think collectively the answer is there to that point. And everybody has insights into different parts of that equation. And so the, the practical purpose, like the practical way to approach it is understand, understand you don't know the whole picture and that's okay. Mm. So we can, we can tackle that equation a couple different ways. One, let's make sure we cover the functional right off the bat, right? So in terms of like messaging, we're in a low involvement category for the most part. Um, like to think that the you know, customers value what our clients do and they have a great experience. Even if they were to check or get a debit every month for the, a membership into their plan, a service plan, I don't join my home service company. I join my church, I join a country club, I join social groups, right? It's a, it's a different emotional attachment to this. So make sure functionality and functional messaging leads first. They have to know that we service these sets of things, right? Cause they're not thinking about that every day like we are. So I can fix these, these problems. Do you have these? And doing that in a creative way is, is, is good, but basically help you understand you're in this army of buyers that needs to hear this next part of the message, which is, don't necessarily call your brother-in-law, call the white van, you know, don't just, don't just make a choice based on, you know, the easiest. Choose us because we're trustworthy, we're available. You know, it's a little bit of a because statement. Um, and you can do a lot of heavy lifting there to separate your business from the industry stereotype, which I still, I hate to think is a thing, but it really is, right? We're still overcoming that in a lot of ways. So that's a part of it. And then what's the financial reason to call me today? Those three pieces help somebody understand I can fix a problem they have. We, we are not, we are not going to rip you off of trust, all that stuff in a, in a nice little bucket. Right. And then here's a reason to call us today. Like we have to 
I think as, as marketers, it's a disservice to not put the last part on there of like some, some financial reason. If I've helped, if I've got you into the, mm-hmm. the funnel, mm-hmm. yes, I have a plumbing problem, electrical problem. What, what, what are you going to do today to make me take action? Because I can wait for, for most things once there's an emergency. So that's a big part of where I get part of that mindset shift of trying to stimulate people to take that action before they may be ready. That's a great way to kind of, you know, get out of the just capture demand bucket. Um, and the, the best companies in the industry understand that there's a maintenance approach. That's why they have proactive marketing to their, their database. Like that's a, that's a pretty easy thing to get their head around, but it's those functional things are the foundation. Um, then the next level, if you get really good at that, right. Then the next bucket is, can I ask for your attention? That's where the creative comes in. Um, and that's where we're helping out clients who have, you, you're really good operationally. And then you need that next level of just giving you in front of more people. That's step one. So you expand who just knows about you, not good, bad, and different. Just we're in front of more people who have these problems. That's a great way to scale your business to maybe you get to that 10, $12 million range. But now you're competing with other people who are doing the same thing as that, right? Those, those brands have also figured out how to capture that functional army of buyers that are in there every week. How are, how is a customer, how is a homeowner picking between those? Like that's a, that's a, like they're going to choose based on something else. Um, and that's the brand building. And, and brand is a, a bigger discussion, but like, that's the, that's the choice of like, what are we, what's unique about us? That's the, the mindset of how are we just a little bit different? Um, and that's, there's no right or wrong answer there. That's, you know, hopefully, you know, looking inside of helping a client look inside their business and say, you already, you already embody these few things. We can just help you talk about them differently or articulate them. Um, and oftentimes like, and then if in certain cases, it's help them make a choice because they do need something that is differentiating mm-hmm. it down that path. Um, That's an area that really fascinates me, actually, the creative side of branding of finding the discovery period of finding those differentiators and Jeff the last time we talked you had a really good a good quote that I picked up on and that was what problems do you solve that are not your service and I think like that's a good way to think about it when you're trying to establish an emotional connection with your with your target audience yeah and the best brands do that right and then you can go to the, the ones that everybody uses in case studies but they're in case studies for a reason right the Disney's of the world right? Their, their brand promise, which is the core of that idea, mm-hmm. right? Are you, what promise do you live? It's not your service, right? I mean, when you're at that level, Disney delivers on um, keeping the magic of childhood alive, whether it's theme parks or IP or merchandise or movies, like to a streaming service, like those are all natural extensions of that promise. Um, Chick-fil-A, everybody loves that as an example too. Their food, this is controversial, their food is okay. It's not great, right? Um, but there are way more Chick-fil-A raving fans than there are McDonald's fans when the food isn't the differentiator. So what are they what are they buying? It's in alignment with who they their perceived values of who they are. And like that's a that's a choice that the line around Chick-fil-A is a lot longer than the line around McDonald's. Um, because they're buying the alignment with, you know, a belief system. So um, and that manifests in how Chick-fil-A hires differently how they operationalize their business. Like their menu is different, but those are choices that fall out of an understanding of who they are and the promise that they're fulfilling every day. Um, so that's a, that's a, for a home service company, think about every touch point and how you can deliver on your brand promise, how you answer the phone, right? What do your guys look like? What is that experience? Have you designed, have you thought through like not just the sales process, but a customer experience. But there are home service companies that do amazing work with that, right? Because they, they think about it as an experience. Um, those don't cost anything extra. That's just thinking about, you know, the stuff we do every day, like, you know, the training and instilling that into the guys who have to go deliver on it every day. Excuse me. Um, to even to things like, how does the follow-up process work? Like it's a great, there are these tools to, send emails and stay in front of customers. Are you being intentional about how often you're reaching out, how you're reaching them? 
Um, is it relevant? Those tools exist now to customize those things. Those all deliver on whatever the promise should be. And so those are practical things that everybody can do no matter what size is think about to your point, Dave, it's like, what, what am I doing? That's not my service. Um, and if you can articulate that you are light years ahead in the brand building game. Um, well, and this goes back to is, how are you competing with other big brands in your market? Yeah. And ultimately if you're offering the same services, you know, you got to compete on a different level on values yeah. essentially. Yeah. And your brand doesn't start the day you decide to change your logo. Like your brand mm -hmm. exists from day one. Right. Um, it's just, are you building it or eroding it? Um, mm -hmm. And that's a, that'll, that'll put your mind in a, in a pretzel too of like, oh my gosh, if I really want to be about this, every interaction that the customer has with me, every touch point needs a, a strategy. Right. Like that's, that's where the best in class go. But you can start by just understanding what it is and trying to deliver on it more often than not. Yeah, man, that is, that's awesome. And I think, I mean, just for me thinking about building your big brand in that way is um, it kind of gets my imagination going in a way that's really fun and creative, you know, and I'm sure Jeff, that's part of the fun of your job is you get to work with people that they're, they're consciously or unconsciously living these brands. And it's your, your job to kind of bring that out into the forefront and make it conscious. Yeah. Um, and it's fun too. That's why I mentioned, you know, the relationship we have with owners and GMs and, mm -hmm. you know, for even a business of say 25, $40 million, the personalities are still a huge part of that business, right? Like the, the personal philosophy of the leaders of that organization are the values of the company for better or worse. Um, so that's the great part for us is you can just, you, it, it doesn't be, it's not a, it's not a super difficult process because those, those, those people, like you can, you can just help them tell their story. You're not, you're not creating something that's not true. Um, and the best marketing is just storytelling. So for our, from our standpoint, um, it's a, it's a, it's a fun exercise because we're just, we're helping people tell their own story on that brand building side. Awesome, man. That's, <clears throat> Sorry, I was just thinking how many times we've had internal conversations around, you know, who are we, who is wit, who is wit's voice, what does wit want? And one of the things that we've been working on for the last couple of years is actually separating me and the company, right? Because so we're playing this, we're trying to play this slightly different game to where we're looking ahead at, you know, what do multi hundred million dollar and half, you know, half billion dollar and billion dollar companies do well, they start to separate that, right? Like the company takes on a life of its own. And so we're doing this at our little, you know, 20 person company level, like, okay, wait, who is wit? And just because I believe something or something's important to me, doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be important to the company. Um, you know, there's certain things that I do want to instill that are important to me. Um, but then there's certain other things that's like, that's not really that important to me or the company. So like who is wit and like watching it separate and take on these like two identities of their own has been pretty cool. It's fun. And the, the fun part of that is when you see it manifest in the people who join the company or take on these roles, like they already, they're already doing it. You don't have to teach them. Like the people will become the culture and it won't, yeah. that will just happen. If you articulate, this is who, who should, who should be part of our team. We got to find these people and cultivate them and give them the roles to be fulfilled. And like, it's a very Amazon kind of approach, right? Move people around the bus till they find their right seat. And um, it's, when I read those books years ago, I thought it was really kind of silly until I sat in the chair of like, I have to build my own team now. And, you know, hiring based on somebody's just resume and then their skill set isn't the most important part, right? They've got to, they've got to believe what we believe. Why do we come to work? Why do we, what gets excited every morning? Um, if they can find that person and they're smart, then they can learn the skills. Um, yep. So it's, yeah. it's will we hire a lot for willpower over skill power. <laughs> yeah. And I know our clients struggle with that too, where gosh, especially they think about plumbers as unicorns, right? Like you'll take any plumber, but then it often they'll be like, ah, I knew that I knew that guy wasn't the fit and often it doesn't work out. Um, yeah. and intuitively, you know, our clients know that. Um, and so that tends to work itself out where as they become more sophisticated internally too, you know, they're able to make those decisions on, gosh, we could use, 
you know, four more of the skill set, but I, they need to be the skill set plus a culture fit. Yeah. Yep. yep. Well, we, we could do a whole nother show about culture <laughs> and all of that yeah. kind of stuff, which maybe we will. Um, awesome, man. Well, Jeff, this has been amazing. Tons and tons of great information from somebody that has done just, you know, you really do have this great amount of insight from these, you know, multi, multi, uh, I mean, basically billion dollar companies uh, that you get to bring down into here. So uh, you have tons of great information. If people want to learn more about you, Pence Media, where, where should they go? Uh, PenceMedia.com is easy to find. It's a, just a place to get a hold of us. Got our contact info on there. We'd love to just share information. Um, again, answer questions. Um, we'd love to do it. Um, happy to help. Awesome. And, and just for anybody listening, like we've, you know, we've known Jeff and Tree for a while and they're very much like us. Like just, if you have questions, don't be afraid to reach out. They won't bite. They want to answer it. They want to help <laughs> yeah. you build your business. So even if you don't think that maybe you're not a good fit for them right now, or just whatever that is, reach out and at least ask the questions. They're, they're really, really good about providing help. So that's just one of the many reasons why we love you guys. Well, I appreciate that. I need to put straight shooter on our brand guidelines. That's a good one. I need to use that. Yeah. Let me think of that. That's hopefully I love you know, it. just, you know, just a unvarnished perspective, right? Of this is what yep. we think and here's why. And hopefully it's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and there's not a whole lot of marketing companies that give you that, right? Cause yeah, there's just not a lot of marketing companies out there in the industry. So the fact that you guys will just give that direct feedback to actually help somebody is, is huge. Awesome, man. Well, I really enjoyed this guys. Uh, Thank you for the, the forum. Yeah, absolutely. So for anybody listening, definitely go check out Pins Media. Um, uh, shoot Jeff any questions that you have. He'll be happy to answer them. Davis, uh, if you don't have anything else, I'm going to roll into a little wrap up with some of the key takeaways that I got. And then Let's we're going to get everybody back to their day. Awesome. Okay. So some of my biggest takeaways for this are, uh, I love the analogy that Jeff used. Marketing is like fitness. And you've got to put in the work, you've got to put in the time, you've got to, you know, use multiple different strategies to get there. Just doing six minute abs every day is not going to get you a six pack. You've got to be dieting, you've got to be trying new things, and you've got to be consciously choosing what it is that you're doing based on what you want that outcome to be. Somebody who wants to be an Olympic weightlifter is going to have a very different fitness routine than somebody that wants to run, you know, a marathon or a hundred mile race. So you've got to be conscious about that. And there is no silver bullet. We can't say this enough. Like the things that you see in some of these Facebook groups from marketing companies, they're just BS. So you've got to put in the time and the energy to really truly build a brand. Um, and it will absolutely be worth it in the end. Um, so another one, as you grow, you've got to start doing different things. So what got you from a million to 5 million is not going to get you uh, to 5 million to 10 million. What got you to 10 is not going to get you to 20. What got you to 20 is not going to get you to 50 and so on. So you've got to be paying attention at these different levels, just like uh, Jeff talked about, just like you would do things different operationally in your business. You've got to add more layers of management. You've got to do more training, all of these types of things. You've got to be paying attention to this in your marketing. So if you use pay-per-click to get you from 1 million to 3 million, that's not going to work to get you up to 10. You've got to start adding in these other things and, you know, talking to even people like our team, people like Jeff's team, look at the different opportunities out there and take advantage of those. Don't think just because something worked, it's going to help you get help get you to the next level alone. You've got to start adding in these other types of things. Um, understanding that you don't know everything or that you don't have the whole picture and that's okay. So like Jeff talked about, I mean, we're at the very entry phase of really understanding buying patterns for people in home service. And I'm sure that data is going to start to get better collected in better places over the next you know, few years, decade, whatever that is. But even right now, just be okay knowing that you don't know everything and be willing to ask these questions, be willing to test out other things and see what works and get your own feedback. Um, I really like that we talked about brand promise. Uh, and, and the question that Jeff mentioned is, how are we a little bit different? And then what Davis and Jeff had talked about is, what problems do you solve that are not your actual service? And these are great questions to ask and get the answer to when you start doing your marketing or when you start looking for ways to stand out 
within your marketing. So figure out what those things are and start asking uh, or start putting those into your, uh, your different marketing. Because everybody has, you know, the lowest price, the fastest installation, all of that kind of stuff. So find the things that you do differently um, and the problems that you solve that are outside of your service and start talking about those. And then the last point that I think is just absolutely awesome is think about the customer experience. Think about this experience that you're creating, not just the service that you're creating and use this brand promise along the, or in every place along the way of this experience. And Jeff said it really, uh, really good. At every interaction point, think about, are you building or are you corroding trust? And so go through your business, like from the, from the, the advertisement that the person sees to how the person, how your CSR answers the phone. How do they get a call back? What's their first email? What is the first thing the technician says when they get to the home? How do they put on booties? What's the follow-up process? What's, you know, just all of that type of stuff and go through it with this lens of at each of those points of interaction in your customer experience, are you building or eroding trust? I think that was a really, really good one. So tons and tons of great stuff from this interview with Jeff today. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us for today's episode of Home Service Success TV. If you have any other questions, just hit us up in the comments, email, whatever it is. We are here to help. Do not feel like you have to go at this whole marketing thing alone. Just reach out and ask questions. We're here to help. Have an awesome rest of your day.